someone working in, in theater and fiction, um, my relationship to Heschel allowed me to recapture my grandfather. So I was telling the story with my Zeta in my heart. And there's something about Rabbi Heschel's words that captured how I felt with my grandfather on a Friday night and all day Saturday that I spent with him for years and years and years. We'd walk to synagogue together, come home together, and we'd go to bed together. We'd rest in the afternoon and we'd get up. And whenever I read Heschel, I'm with my grandfather, who managed to make everybody in a very anti-Semitic community that I grew up in love him. Mm. And so it's a double story for me. The tree? I said this the other night, so for people who may have heard it before, the tree is my wife, Franny. Um, she loves trees. I learned to love trees through her relationship to trees. Mm. She talks to trees, she pats trees, um, and so this, the tree is, is about my relationship with her. Did your dad have any particular affinity for trees? No, but we would take walks in Broadway and then turn down the hill to Riverside Drive where we lived and we would see the sunset and he was always very moved by that mm. and by the view of the river and yeah when he lived in Vilna you I'm sure know the story he would put a yarmulke on his head when he entered the forest he didn't know Cardinal Bayard as well as he did in this play of course mm. Cardinal Bayard didn't come to our home but other Christian theologians did and my father did have a special relationship with many of them and they even if they didn't know my father very well, the nuns that you refer to, or priests, or pastors, came to our home often experiencing something quite profound. That is, for many of them, what I felt as a child when I look back, many of them came as if they were on a religious pilgrimage. It was the first time they had ever been to a Shabbat dinner or to a Passover Seder first time they had been with a Jewish family and seen a rabbi pray at the table and they were very moved. My father never talked to them about Pius XII or Christian anti-Semitism because he didn't have to. You could see it in their faces that in encountering my father they suddenly started encountering their own conscience as Christians. That was the impact that he had and that was quite profound. So in this sense, the relationship with Cardinal Bea, as I assume you intended it, was a metaphor for something much Absolutely. broader. Absolutely. Well, they met in Chicago in 1963 at a conference on religion and race, two words that my father said should never be uttered together. Dr. King arrived at the conference after my father had already spoken. That's a, a speech that was printed in the book, The Insecurity of Freedom. But he heard that it had been a great speech, and they met. And so they met initially just as two people, not as people speaking. And something happened between them. Something sparked. Um, and they felt a certain immediate closeness. Clarence Jones, who was Dr. King's personal lawyer and attended everything, used to tell me or told me often that Dr. King would interrupt a meeting and say, call Rabbi, someone call Rabbi Heschel and see if he's free to come on that date or call Rabbi Heschel and see what he thinks. But there was an intimacy and that I think is very striking that, that two people from such different backgrounds mm -hmm. could come together and form that kind of friendship. And of course we understand it's the Bible and the prophets. I think it's extraordinary for my father to come from Nazi Germany where the Christian theologians were saying throw the Old Testament out of the Bible, it's a Jewish book <coughs> yeah, and it doesn't belong in a Nazi Christian Bible. And Jesus wasn't Jewish, he was an Aryan, etc. And he comes to this country, and here's Dr. King making the exodus the central motif of the civil rights movement. You know, I've read a lot about the relationship, but for me that picture in the Selma Bridge um, is, is searing. Part, and a lot of it, I, mean, I think a lot of it is transferential. I mean, the fact that there's a Jewish rabbi there on that bridge is very important to me. Mm. And because it's someone who's, whose interior life I know a little bit about from the writing, makes me feel like I'm there. Mm. So it's, it's less knowing the facts and more about the connection. And, and the, the message of, of that image and how important it is to you today, is it, is it particularly important today, this moment in history? Is it less important than it was, more important than it was? How, how significant do you think it is now? I think it's painfully important today. It's painfully important. Um, 
that there should be the enormous gap between um, religiously conscious Jews and American blacks at this point, I think, is just agonizing. And that um, Jewish... I mean, I have to be very careful about this because, because the majority, the, a disproportionate number of progressive activists in America are still Jewish and are very significant to any kind of conscience this country has. On the other side of that, it's tragic to see Jewish self-interest and, and um, self-protection um, act to sever that long-term historical connection. There are, of course, those who say after the, after the Shoah, after the Holocaust, it should never happen again to Jews. And my father said it should never happen again to the world, to anybody. And you know, he used to talk about Hiroshima and Auschwitz. He put the two together in, in sentences, which is also rather striking looking back. But there's another element here too that I mentioned, that in Hasidic thought, my father was so immersed in that, Hasidic thought, what we do has cosmic ramification, that is, when I do an act that is kind or good, a mitzvah, when I do a mitzvah, I give strength to God. I help bring about redemption. Now in Hasidic thought, the mitzvahs that they're talking about have to do with things like making kiddush, certain prayers, and before I say the prayer, I say, may I do this with the intention, with the kavana, that I should bring about a redemption of the Kaddish Baruch Hu and the Shechina. The re yeah, uh, a redemption, yeah through that mitzvah. My father broadened it and said, also the mitzvahs that you do um, between one person to another, that is, social responsibility for other human beings, that too gives strength to God. And that is, in fact, let's say, um, I wouldn't, it's an addition. He's expanding, in some sense, that Hasidic theology in a broader direction to include all the commandments that we have in Jewish life that are very much concerned about our relations with one another and all dimensions, on a personal dimension, on a business dimension, everything. That too brings redemption, gives strength to God. I found him so learned when I came to him with my homework and we were studying something from the Middle Ages or the Renaissance, whatever it was, he knew so much. My father studied all the time. He rarely went out. There was no such thing as entertainment. That was a waste of time. Maybe twice my parents went to a movie. Once or twice a year, maybe a concert or theater. My mother went to a lot of concerts because she was a pianist. But, uh, but he studied all the time. Always there was a book, always. And that was a wonderful way to grow up, too, to be encouraged. Thing. He also, though, we he would start a sentence, and one of us would finish it. And that was also a lot of fun. Uh, there was a kind of intimacy of thought that I enjoyed very much. When I was growing up, he asked me to make Kiddush on Shabbos morning or to lead us in Berkat zone. I didn't know that women aren't supposed to be counted in the Muslim for Barakat Amazon until I grew older, because it wasn't an issue uh, for him. It was just a natural thing. And that's, again, something I appreciate. He never showed me barriers. He always was opening things and including me in every way. Sometimes when he gave a lecture, a few times, I remember, I always went with my parents when he would give a lecture from the time I was very little. And once or twice, I remember being very lonely. We were in Chicago, and I had no friends, and I was sad. And in the middle of his lecture, he mentioned me. And that was a gift, and I was so touched by that. Hmm. So he was a wonderful father, and I think if you read his books, you can imagine. And that's really what he was as a father, whatever you would imagine from his writings. During the process of the Second Vatican Council's formulation of Nostra Aetate that had to do with the church's relationship with, with the Jews, there were several different drafts that were developed before the final document was produced. And the, the second draft that came out uh, had a suggestion that the church would hope for the eventual conversion of the Jews, and my father was terribly upset at that point. Not so much that he got angry, he would just get very, very upset 
upset. It, it couldn't, he couldn't study. He couldn't concentrate. Sometimes he would have to lie down. Sometimes he was pacing the floor, very upset. And he issued a statement at that point saying, I would rather go to Auschwitz than give up my faith. And I can say, when I heard him say that, I was very, I was very frightened. That was a very strong statement from him to speak in those terms. So I wouldn't say so much anger, but, but yes, he got very upset. And at the same time, he also knew that this was even the smallest little step that the Vatican took was a big step if you look at it in terms of Jewish history. And he was appreciative of that and always did look at things in terms of Jewish history and appreciated what could be done even in a small way. When my, father's, when my father was just nine years old when his father passed away in Warsaw and my father was the youngest in the family and as you heard in the play uh, my grandmother and three of my father's sisters were killed. My father had another sister and a brother who both got out. My father came from Hasidic royalty. And you know, he said something that I think is really very special. And that is, he said he grew up surrounded by people of religious nobility. And I think that's a wonderful phrase, religious nobility because it meant in that world in Eastern Europe to be such a religious person, that was royalty. He carried that with him and the teachings always. He had a lot of Hasidic forum uh, on one wall in his study and he would point to those books and say to me, this is your Yerusha, this is your inheritance. And of course he taught all the time about this Rebbe, that Rebbe, ancestors and so on, told stories and at the dinner table or as bedtime stories to me. Uh, and so there was very much of that presence. And sometimes when he felt worried and despondent, he always used to say to me, remember, remember who your ancestors are. Remember what you stand for. So they lived inside of him. Uh, you know, uh, my father wrote his last book on the Kotzka Rebbe, who was a Hasidic Rebbe, very, very concerned about hypocrisy and mendacity, and, and demanded always that Judaism has to be fresh and authentic. My father reflects this also in one of his earliest books, Man is Not Alone, where he says, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, you can't live your Judaism the way your grandparents lived it. Because that, and this is his phrase, that would be spiritual plagiarism. That's great. Isn't that great? That's great. Well, in, in a speech he gave at a new White House conference on old age, aging, it was called, uh, he gave a, a speech called To Grow in Wisdom. And he said, the ability to change one's mind is the mark of wisdom. And so, yes. He always wanted to reconsider, and, and he also felt very strongly, you know, when he was growing up, everybody expected him to be the next Hasidic Rebbe in the family, and he would have been, but he felt, and he said, that the world needed something else from him, that the world didn't need him to be a Hasidic Rebbe, it needed something else. And so he did, in fact, change in that respect, or at times when I would complain to him about being relegated upstairs in the garish stable that we occasionally went to on the Upper West Side and have to listen through the dumbwaiter to the davening. And he would say, yes, Judaism has to change. He said to me once, when I said, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, and he said, well, why don't you become a rabbi? And I said, no, 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 that'll never happen. And I'll tell you, women rabbis. He said, I think things are changing. So he was, in fact, open to the future, even as he always had a sense of, of history. Mm -hmm.